know that you want Jesus to be glorified in your life today. Come and get up on your feet, children of God. Get up on your feet. Hallelujah. And let's praise him together. Hallelujah. We give you glory, Lord.
Lord, even as we have gathered to hear your word today, O oh God, we pray that you open the heavens and pour out your word upon us in the name of Jesus. Amen. And that it will hear directly from your children. That you will show us your heart in the name of Jesus. Amen. That every heart here will be receptive in the name of Jesus. Amen. That your word will truly come and change our life in the name of Jesus. Amen. So God, this word will catapult us into preparing our next generation in the name of Jesus. And I say, Lord, none of me or all of you in the name of Jesus, O God. Use me to your glory in the name of Jesus, O God. Thank you, Father. Thank you for anointing my tongue, Lord. I give you all the glory. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray. Shall we be seated? First of all, I just want to uh, say a big thank you to the pastor for the opportunity to stand here. And thank you to God. It's always a privilege to be able to bring the word of God. And, um, you know, it's the, the this month is the teenagers, um, the teenagers and the youth in the children's month, and um, we're calling them. We're uh, preparing the the the, um, the theme for this month has been preparing the future generation, preparing the next generation. And you know, Pastor was saying about the children that came up here that those are our future, those are next generation, and that's the truth. I mean, like you can remember when you used to stand up there. I don't know about you. I used to be there go and do memory verses and everything. Now, if I stand up here and just remember verses, it will not be cute anymore. You know, but when the kids come here and say that, we know that that is our generation. The pastor said something, said the word is actually growing in them. And that is what we, uh, and that's what the children department have been doing. That's what the teenager department, the teenagers department, they've been doing. That's what we've been trying to do. When we bring our kids to church, is to prepare them for, the, for, the, for, for what they're going to do. Um, encounter in life. It's, it is a step to prepare the next generation. And that word says preparing the future generation. And if you look at it, what does it truly mean to prepare? Like, what is the word preparation? What does it mean? It's like I was just thinking about it, and the first thing that came to my mind is to make ready. Like, you're making ready for something, you're setting something up. You know, to, to empower, to equip, to when we think about it, to prepare yourself when you want to go out, when you want to prepare, the first thing you do is like you take a shower, you get ready, you get yourself set up. And that is what we're talking about. We're talking about to set up the next generation. We're talking about to set up, to make them ready for something. There has been, there's been an assignment, and you know the text that, um, that, that's been attached to, to the theme, uh, the, the, the book, and, 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 and talking about David when he died, and he called the son. David, it was an urgency. You could hear an urgency in what David was saying to Solomon, and he was talking to him, and he was like, Solomon, I go in the ways of my father, or do this and do that and everything. So uh, David was actually setting Solomon up for the future. And I was just thinking, I was like, um, how did he get to that point? How did he get to the point where it was just an urgency telling him, okay, now I go, I have to tell you this, I have to tell you that. And you know, there was a process. Why, did, why that was an urgency? It was a process. David didn't ju just get there overnight. But David actually took his time, and there was a reason why he, he saw that there's, a, there's something Solomon asked to do. And today we're just, I'm going to be talking, talking about why and how to prepare our generation. I mean, why do we need to prepare our generation? What is the main reason why God has called us as parents? What is the main reason why God has called us as mentors? What, what is the reason God has called us as role models to prepare this next generation? And I just want you to open your Bibles with me to um, Psalm 127 verse 4. Psalm 127 before. It says, like arrows in the hands in the hand of a warrior, so are the children is of one youth. I talked about what preparation means, right? I said preparation is to set up, to make ready. So now, what is the next generation? What is the future generation? The Bible gave us a very simple definition from what I just read. It says, like arrows in the hand of a warrior. The next generation, they're not just, yes. If you say they're just youth, they're just children, that definition is very limiting. We have to see them as arrows. You know, we have to see them that there's something, they are more than just my kids to come and, oh, hey, bring me the remote. You know, there's a funny, like, if you go on all this Instagram, like, the funny things Nigerian parents do, they'll be like, um, the kids make fun of us a lot. I just want you to let you guys know. And, like, they, you call them from upstairs and they'll be like, oh, come and give me the remote, and the remote is right next to you. They are more than that. They are more than, like, you know, my, my little nephew, 
my nephew will be like, am I your maid when I start sending? I'm like, I do work for you, you know? Then one then like, that's what he, 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 he's like, why are you always sending me up and down? And uh, it, it's just, it, it could be fun and they're laughing and everything, but the children, you know, like, in, they're more than what we used to think that, oh, they're just to make me go follow me to the farm and go cultivate and bring money. No, the Bible says they're more than that, they're arrows. And when you think about an arrow, what is an arrow? An arrow is an instrument. It's something, an instrument, it's a weapon, an instrument of, of fight. And the Bible says they're like arrow in the hands of a warrior. There are two things. First, you have the arrow. If I pick up an arrow today and I try to shoot that arrow, it's not nothing born an arrow, there's nothing, I can't do it because I've not been trained for it. So I have to be a warrior, I have to take the classes, I have to be able to, to be trained in that, in that aspect, to be able to shoot this arrow. And when you're shooting an arrow, you're not just shooting randomly. There's a target, there's something that you, you want to propel. You're going to, like, you're going to propel the arrow to. You're going to push, but you know, when you take the arrow, you're not just going to, like, if I try to do that, it's, two things will happen. I'll either hurt myself, or I'm not going to reach my target because I'm not being prepared. But, you know, if you're prepared, you know, the way they position themselves, it's different. The way they will, the first they will apply to it, it's, it's kind of, it's always different. And, you know, I see them, they have to, they put their eyes like this and they're, they're looking at their target, meaning there's a purpose why they're shooting that arrow. It's not just random. It's more like that. So why? Why do we need to prepare? And I talked about David, and we, you know, if you trace David's, um, why, when, before David got to that position, to so Second Kings that we've been reading, before he got to that position, there was something that happened. And if we go to Book of um, of Second Samuel, Second Samuel chapter seven. I'm going to read from verse 1. It says, Now it came to pass, when the king was dwelling in the house, and the Lord had given him rest on all his enemies all around, that the king said to Nathan the prophet, See, now I dwell in the house of Cedar, but the ark of God dwells inside the tent. Then Nathan said to the king, Go and do all that is in your heart. And this was just, just to tell us the story, because there's no time. David sat down. David was, after fighting battle, he thought about it. He said, I want to do something for God. I want to build a house for God. You know, as parents, we think about, I want to um, set up my generation. I want to I want to do something. You know, I want to do this. I want to do that. I want to achieve something. And that's what David was exactly in that position. But, you know, and then Nathan told him, go and do what you want to do. But um, he wanted to build a house for God. But God had to interrupt him and tell him something. And God told David that I don't want you to build a house. But why did God just want David to build a house for him? And the first reason why we need to prepare our generation is that God, there has to be a successor to every predecessor. David, in that point, David, if you if we read the book of, of Samuel, I'm just going to try to tell us the story. God told David and told him that, I don't want you to build a house for me. Not because I don't like you, not because you're not going to be able to do it, but I want somebody else to do it. And, and, and if we go further to um, um, verse 12, it says, when your days are fulfilled and you rest with your father, I will set up your seed after you, who will come from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. Verse 13 says, He shall build a house for my name. There has to be a success. Um, there has to be someone that will succeed. That's the first reason why we need to prepare the next generation. There has to be someone that will take over from you. Like there has to be someone, like you know, they, there has to be you know they tell you that oh your son looks like you. There's some your son is an extension of you, your daughter is an extension of you. And this generation is an extension of the next generation. And there will be there will come to there will come a time where our time is up. We are gonna, you know, the word is expired, and you know, when I don't want to say we're gonna go, but there'll be a time when we are tired, we can't do anything anymore. And this was what God was telling David. God told David, He said, "It's not you that I want. I want your son." And God had to. And as parents, sometimes we get so busy and we get so focused on, "I want to do this. I want to do this." But thank God for God. God came to um, to David and told him that, "Stop. This is the time." Your time as, you know, what you've done for me is good. This is the time where somebody else has to take place. And you know, this is the time where, this is the time for a new season. I need something else. I need your son. I need to, ex to extend the mercy. I need to use your son also. And this was God. God wasn't just like dismissing David and saying, now that you're old. No, God was trying to tell him that it's time for you to prepare your son. 
And if you look at it in the book of, um, in, in, like I said, uh, in, in, in the Bible, you will see that Abraham had, had Isaac and he was able to pass something down to Isaac. And Isaac had Jacob. And Jacob had, you know, had sons and he was able to pass it on. And as parents, we have to see that everything we are doing is not just to build an empire for us, it's to build an empire for a generation to come. And if that is the reason, you will tell our kids, oh, you're the reason I'm working. You know, you're the reason, the reason I'm doing this. If that is the reason, there's a need to prepare these people that you want to take over. There's a need for you to prepare them to take over. Because guess what? We said they're an extension of you. If they're not well prepared, if you cannot, if they're not well equipped, they're going to fail. They're going to fail and bring disgrace to you. Let's look at examples in the Bible. Eli in the Bible was one person that God, God already set up. God already said, oh, Eli needed somebody to take over him. And his sons were following in his footsteps. They were priests. They were in the house of God. But because Eli didn't take that time out to invest in his, in the, in his sons, they disgraced him. And guess what? God had to bring somebody from outside, Samuel, because God will never leave his, his house vacant. No, there will be someone that will always be able to take over. And guess what? Do it better than, than you can do it. And that is why it's our responsibility to look, to look at our kids. The first thing is like, I have to do this. Why? Because this guy is going to represent me. He's going to carry my name onward. This, this child of mine, this daughter of mine, she, she's going to be, she's going to talk about me everywhere I go. You know, they, you know they're going to, when people look at them, they'll ask you, I mean, we're from, like, we're all from, most of us are from Nigeria. The first thing people ask you, you know, is like, oh, what's your name? Oh, who is your father? That's what they ask, you know, they ask this and that. So that means that they want to know the kind of home you're coming from. So if anything happens, they're able to point to your home and say, oh, this and this and this will happen. And you don't want to fail God. This is, and that, I feel God was looking at David and said, I know something, but I've been looking at Eli and I had to bring somebody else to bring something. But David, I love you so much. So let me interrupt your plans right now and tell you that I don't want you to fail me. I want somebody else because it's the, you know, this life that we live in, it's continuity. We call it the circle of life. It doesn't end with me and you. Somebody else has to come and take charge. And that's what, that was what God came to do and say, and, and told David that you need to, there's somebody else I need that is coming in and you need to prepare that person and you need to uh, and, and, and you need to first of all recognize that somebody else will take over and the second reason why we need to actually prepare this generation now we talked about them like God needs we need uh, somebody to succeed and the second reason why we need to prepare them is because these kids are young and inexperienced and and, and, and we forgot to look at first uh, first Chronicles chapter 22 first Chronicles chapter 22 then David said, this is the house of the Lord God, and this is the altar of burnt offering for, for, for Israel. So David commanded to gather the aliens who were in the land of Israel, and he appointed masons to cut hewn stones to build the house of God. And David prepared iron in, in, in abundance for the nails of the doors of the gate, and for the joints and the bronze in abundance, and beyond measure, and cedar trees in abundance for the Sidonites and, tho and those from Tyre, brought from cedar wood to David. Chapter five, it says, Now David said, Solomon my son is young and inexperienced, and the house of the Lord to be built must be exceedingly magnificent, famous and glorious throughout all country. I will now make preparation for it. So David made abundant preparation before his death. Like I talked about in Second Kings, when he was dying, that was why he quickly had to call David and um, Solomon. But David did something before. He looked at his son and he's like, the reason why I need to prepare for you is because you're young and, inexper and inexperienced. You don't really know anything. All you have is excitement. You know, these kids, they have energy, they have this, they have that. But they are so inexperienced. And that's why they need uh, uh, us. Why didn't God, like, and I was thinking about it, that like, God, why did you have to go meet someone that is young and inexperienced? David was a veteran, you know, David was already experienced, he could hear you already, you know, God, David was already close to you, why didn't you just use David? And God said to me, because every generation, they have their own assignment, they have something they have to do. You know, the, the generation of David, God told David, David, God told David and said, yours is to fight. You fought, David, your hands are full, they're filled with blood. I don't want that kind of hand to build the next thing. 
That's what God told David. He said, I mean, God could have overlooked it, but God is like, David, you, you're full of something else. Like, you're getting old. You're like, crayfish, excuse me, if I bend you, you're going to break at this point. I need someone that is young and inexperienced. And that word is not negative. That word is actually wide and broad. Young and inexperienced, meaning it's a blank canvas. You know, nothing has ever been done to it before. It's unused. It is like new. It is fresh. And that is why, in, 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 but David looked at it and said, okay, yes, you're young and inexperienced and everything. Let me use my own experience. I see the world before you is glorious and mighty. What I look at, you have to look at these children and look at what they are facing. It's truly different from what you have faced as, as, uh, in the past. You know, we need to get away from the mentality of that's how it has always been done in the past. I have news for you. Change is the only constant thing in life. And God is, God is the only thing that never changed. But, Bible says that, and, but the famous thing that we say about him is the unchangeable changer. God, the change is the only constant thing in life. And God needed change. He needed fresh ideas and if you look at it like computer all these things are not new right like you know those the, the phones they're not new it came from the generation before us well guess what they gave us the big walkie-talkie imagine if we're still working with the big walkie-talkie and everything well fresh ideas came in and like how can we make this smaller and that's what our spirit we have to see in our kids we, david saw the potential in like okay i've already let me but let me just lay the foundation prepare the next generation is just laying the foundation and what david did was to embrace the change that was going to come to him you know when the facebook and all these things first came there were two generations right the generation the parents were like oh it's bad it's horrible no don't go on facebook and yes it was bad and horrible but the kids were so excited they were excited to share their pictures they were excited to like you know what is this thing about what I can, you know, and then from like, you know, before, it wasn't Facebook at first, I like, think it was MySpace. And then somebody came along, how can I introduce i5? And then from i5, somebody came around them like, okay, how can I introduce Facebook? Things are always going to change. And we, the older ones, because we don't understand it, when you don't understand, you're going to fight. That's the truth. You're going to fight it like, I don't understand it, I'm not going to do it. In the generation before, they didn't used to do it like that. You know, we, we will say that. And it's normal. But I want to, what I'm trying to tell us this morning is that we have to not fight these changes in the youth. We have to find a way that how can I use this, how can I help them use this instrument to better their life? We cannot say, I'm not, don't go on Facebook, don't go on Snapchat, don't go on this and that. No, we as parents have to look at that. We have to look at it. How can I help these kids know how to use this instrument, God, how can I be able to educate them and tell them that, okay, this and this, if you're on Facebook, if you're on this, let me see what you're doing. Show, go on Facebook, look at parental controls. Don't fight the change, embrace the change, and look for ways that would be able to help them, that would propel them, and then be like, okay, this is what you can do. You know, go on the website, you as parent, don't be left out. Yes, they call us old school, but we can be new school, we can change. Bible, like, Bible talks about renewing our mind. It's not just in the word of God. We have to be able to roll with the punches. I mean, you don't have to be on Facebook sharing your pictures because if you're my mom, I would not want to have you, you know, it can be embarrassing. But what we can do is to just monitor them and be like, Mommy, I love you, sir. But you know, it's like with things we can do that can truly just teach them the right ways to use this, this, this new things that are coming. If we're even in the church of God, if these young people come and they come with ideas and we're talking about oh, changing the church around, guess what? It's for it's not for you and me. We're okay with the old catchy job because this is what we grew up with. But if we for, we see the pastor's vision and we see this and we're able to follow that, we know that it's going to attract more generation. Because they look at it like, what is this cool thing that is going on here? They'll be able to come in and like it will be more inviting to them. If it's not like if they're passing by and they see, they'll think like all they do here is sing hymns and and just like uh, no, that's not what we do here. We want to do something. So if as 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 Pastor was talking, we as parents, we need to just rally around them and be like, yes, let's make this happen. 250000 it's not a big money if we, do, if we believe and trust in God for it. And just look at it, that we're not doing it for ourselves. If I'm going to pay that $100 and if I'm going to reach out to my, to 
my to my to my friends and family. I'm not just doing it for myself. I'm not doing it because pastor they've come again to ask for money. No, I am doing it for the future generation. I'm doing it to make it a comfortable food table place for them. I'm doing it because they want you. You know, they like to boast. Like I don't know that if they have a nice house, they'll be able to point to it and be like, oh. That's my house. So if this church, the Bible the church is supposed to be a house, the, if the pastor wants to make it more beautiful, I'm just enjoying I was so happy sitting down there. Yes, go pastor. And that's what we need this morning to be to do that. And be like, let's just do it and just rally around him and do it and, 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 and go from there. That is what they're young and inexperienced for. Don't, don't fight this change in them. If they come and we say we want to um, do, you know, we want to uh, have an, uh, the uh, projector and they come with a new idea. Yeah, well, instead of this projector, how can we do this? Let's listen to them. Let's listen to what they're saying. Sometimes, yes, the idea can be broad and everything. Let's just tell them, okay, let's narrow it down. But don't shut them out. Because guess what? Our own time will expire. We don't use we don't use what we our parents used to use. No. The things th things have changed. It's a new season. Please look at your neighbor and say it's a new season. Things are changing. Get with the program. And so that's what we're talking about this morning. Young and inexperienced. So if they call us old, oh, let's not act as if we're old. Let's show them that we can we can join them. So the next thing we want, like I just want to talk about is that how do we now we've talked about them being arrows and everything. So how do we now get to this point? How do we prepare them? And I just want to read from First Chronicles chapter 22. First Chronicles chapter 22, and um, and um, this was David. After David saw that what he had to do was magnificent, David now did something. He said, David, he, then he called for his son Solomon and charged him to build a house for the Lord God of Israel. The first thing David did was to plant a godly vision and seed in them. Yes, David saw that he was young and inexperienced. And you know what he proceeded to do in chapter in verse six? He said he, he called him and charged him to build an house for the Lord God of Israel. That was planting the seed in him. That was like telling him, This is what I want you to do. And as parents, it's not about what we want our children to become. It's about what God wants them to become. What David did in this chapter six was laying out God's plan. Guess what? You know, God didn't go to to to, to Solomon directly and said, Solomon, you're going to build a house for me. No, God gave the plan. God gave that secret and He gave the plan to David. So as parents, we are caretakers. You know, there's an owner for the, for the kids. You know, we have to go back to God and be like, God, what do you want my kids to become in the future? Don't just tell them be a doctor be a nurse, be a lawyer. It's more than that. We have to be able to see and recognize. And we cannot see with our just physical eyes. We can only see through the word of God. Through prayers, you have to be able to hear what God is saying about this particular. You have to pay attention. David was paying attention. Was like, That's how we discovered that this guy is young and inexperienced. But look at the great people in the world today. They, most of them are their parents back in. I'll talk about Serena Williams and you know the, the, the tennis players. They had a parent that could recognize their talent. And you know, guess what? The parent, I'm sure the parent recognized their talent by encouraging them, would take them to the tennis. So you have to be able to recognize the talent in your kids. What is this child good about and good in? What what is this child? What does she like to do? Don't, don't, don't try to stifle it when you notice it. We as parents are supposed to nurture that. If the, if your child can sing, invest in um, in singing lessons. You don't know what they can use that singing to do. If your child can, if they're good in football. Miss Church Sunday, one Sunday, and go watch them play football. It's okay. It just shows them because this, I mean, this, these kids are always playing on Sundays and things like that. It's okay. You're nurturing them. Talk to the coaches. Don't, don't be a backbone parent. Be involved in what they're doing. Get to know them. When they come back from school, tell them, are you in it? What are you doing? Don't just let them be. I mean, look at these Asian parents. They're always involved in, I mean, they drive their kids to excellence. They drive them. And that's what we as parents, we need to do. We need to plant that godly vision and proceed to help them nurture it and talk and just talk about it. Like drive them to this driving and to whatever they want to do in life. If your child comes to you and tells you that 
oh, this is what I want to become. And you truly recognize it and like, okay, son, you have a talent in that. Encourage that son. Let him go in that path. It's okay for them to be. And I just want to talk to the youth. It's okay for you to be yourself. If you have a talent, if you have something you want to do, the Bible says that do not let no one despise the days of your youth. No, don't let nobody tell you you cannot be what you want to be. Unfortunately, there are so many people that will be like, oh, you're black, you're decent. And I tell us every time, it doesn't matter what, look at your differences in your life as, uh, as in the things that make you different. Look at the things, those are the things that God will use, will take and use to, to elevate you and push you into the next level. So if you have a dream and you truly know that that dream is part of what God's work, go for it. You know, the Bible says that the heart of a king is in the hands of God. You don't have to fight your parents. You just have to get on your knees and pray and God and say, God, show my parents that this is my talent. Show my parents that this is what I want to do. You don't have to just go and just like, oh, this is what they set out for me. But if you have that talent, go for it. Try for it and reach for it. And God will help us in Jesus' name. Amen. And the next thing that um, David did was, the next thing David did in 11 and 12, in verse 11 and 12, Verse 11, and son. It says, Now, my son, may the Lord be with you, and may you prosper and build the house of the Lord your God, as I said to you. That's the second thing they did. He prayed for David. That's all. He prayed for David. We as parents, we have to pray. Pray for your kids according to the plans of God. We have to pray for David. Keep praying for David. And, the last, and then another thing David did in verse 17, he says, David also commanded leaders of Israel to help Solomon his son, saying, is, you know, he, what he did then was he surrounded them with mentors. He surrounded them, and I talked about going to their coaches, going to their teachers. If you know your, your child wants to be a doctor, and you come to church, and you know there are doctors in church, go talk to that doctor, put your child, it takes a, a whole village to reach out to the child. Take that child and hand it over to the doctor, like my child wants to be a doctor. How can you help us? If you know somebody is very good with scholarship and things like that, surround your kids with that. Most of us pay for school. And, and, and I discovered that there are so many ways. I, I mean, I just want to put you on the spot. I'm sorry, Sister Kemi. She's one person I would encourage every parent to talk about. She was telling me how she went through school and she didn't have to pay something. So as parents, this is an invitation. Excuse me. Just go to her and talk to them. That's one person that can truly tell us how we don't have, our kids don't have to struggle. You know, look around you. There are so many, there are so many mentors that you can help, that you open your kids up to, encourage them to talk and invite them to your house. And that's what we can, that's how we can use. So that's what, those are the things we can use to help our kids in life. And, and the lastly, you know, when David talked to, we talked about, we've talked about the parents, or kids. When David talked to Solomon, if we go, time will not permit, to look, permit us to look at it. David and Solomon did something. Solomon listened to David. Yes, David was old, but Solomon listened. And this is where I'm talking to you. You need to listen to your parents. You cannot just push them to the side. You, they, have, they have experience. They, 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 they've been there, they've done that. You know, this. They, they know what they're talking about. Don't fight them. Don't listen to them, what they're trying to say. Don't think they're they are, they are not cool, they're not this and that. Truly make your parents, because right now we've told them they're gonna be more open. They wanna know what you wanna do. So go to your parents and talk to them. And when they advise you, make sure you listen to your parents. Or Obedience. Obedience is the number one thing. And they, because Solomon obeyed, we talk about how Solomon is wise and everything, but we didn't know that he obeyed and he followed his father's instruction. And he asked God, and that was when God, he, he first followed God and his father's instruction before God visited him in the dream. God didn't visit him in the dream first. He did something that attracted God. And that is what obedience would do, to, would do for us. So obey our parents in everything they say to us. No matter how old we were, we should obey them and reverence them. And I pray that God will help us in Jesus name. Let's just know. Let's just bow our heads at this moment and just say, God, I have heard God like you've spoken to me today, oh God. As a parent, I am inadequate. I don't know what to do. I don't know how to do it. The gender, it's, it's confusing. It's confusing. Things are changing. Like, things are not the same anymore. Lord, help me. Equip me as a parent today. Lord, equip me too, so that I can equip the next generation in the name of Jesus, oh God. And let's just pray for the next generation and say, God, give them a listening heart in the name of Jesus. Jesus, oh God, help them to be teach to, to be teachable in the name of Jesus. Don't let them, don't let our words just fall on on a, on the ground that will not germinate in the name of Jesus, oh God. Cover them with your blood in Jesus' name. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray. Amen.
Okay, let me for Jesus go ahead and clap for him. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. I believe God is speaking to us concerning his future generation. That's a different dimension of preparing our children. And I believe before the month is over, the Almighty God will empower us and will empower the next generation. Let's rise up on our feet even at this time. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Father, you are God, the all knowing, the all seeing. Lord, your word has comfort. We ask, Lord, for divine wisdom. We ask for your empowerment. We ask for your know how. It is not by power, it is not by might. Help us, Lord, to do what is needful. Once again, we lift up our children unto you. Father, as we take the steps of doing what is right in your sight, because except you, the Lord, build the house, the labor you build and build it. Father, you will empower everything that we do for them. You give our children a receptive heart to learn wisdom and to understand wisdom. And we pray, Lord, that even as they speak to us about their needs and their concerns, we'll be open and receptive unto them. Father, create that balance for growth between the mentor and the mentee, that at the end of everything, your name alone will be glorified. Thank you, precious Lord. And I ask God that you continue to bless your daughter that you have used today. Yes. Father God, continue to use her. Yes. Even in the areas of teaching the teenagers and those that you have brought to us of influence. Father, bless her and prosper her. In Jesus' name. Amen. Bless somebody say, Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. Amen. At this time, we are going to 